Hello, I've played a lot of V Rising. I was a big fan of Battle Ride, and when V Rising was announced, I dove in fangs first. So, with over 250 hours in the game since the beginning of Early Access up until now, I thought I'd be able to put together a list of things that are helpful if you start playing V Rising now. So, I did, and here they are the 13 things I think are good to know when you start playing V Rising. The first tip is to ignore everything the game tells you to do after you've gotten your basic tools and head straight to the Alpha Wolf. I know you won't be able to track V-Bloods, but you'll usually find the Alpha Wolf around here, which is the Wolf's Den. The reason you do this is to unlock the Wolf Form shapeshifting ability. In the early stages of the game, you won't have regular access to a horse, so you'll want to run in Wolf Form all the time since it's the fastest way to get around. Oh? Uh, uh, <laughs> so this is not supposed to happen. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven horses in Farbane. God damn it. Eight? Who put an entire stable in Farbane? Aha, I found the culprit. In order to beat the wolf without having gotten better gear than the most basic bone stuff, you just need to make sure to counter and dash away from the correct attacks. He'll dash forward in a straight line to try and attack you, move out the way and hit him with your shadow bolt. When he howls and goes red, you can counter to deal some damage, become immaterial and move away to not get hit by any of the other bites. The trickiest part is when he summons a couple of regular wolves. It's a good idea to not use your counter and then immediately your space or vice versa. Use one of them and then create some distance between you and the wolf. Land safe attacks and let the cooldown of one of your defensive abilities tick down a bit before you use the other. You don't want to end up in a situation where the wolf gets too close and both your counter and your dash is on cooldown. When the regular wolves are summoned, try to take them out as fast as you can by using tip number two. Tip number two, use your bite as a way to finish off enemies and reposition. Press F to start biting an enemy and then hit your basic attack button, normally M1, to instantly kill the target without consuming its blood. When you fight multiple enemies, you'll want to do this as an other way on top of your counter and your dash to evade enemy attacks. The Alpha Wolf fight is a great example. Tip number three is to find the enemies called Dead Eyes, because they drop whetstones and you want to pick up as many of these as you can. You'll always find quite a few Dead Eyes in bandit encampments, not camps. The reason you want to do this is that you'll need them to build grinders, and when it's time to upgrade your base from wooden palisades to an actual castle, you'll need a lot of bricks and planks. And it's not a bad idea to have at least two grinders constantly making bricks. Next is that you'll want to pick up all the copper coins that enemies drop. Take them to the shady merchants that you can find here and here and buy books. Getting the books you need to unlock better gear can take a lot of time if you just rely on the chance of enemies dropping them. Books that are especially important to get are those that unlock different types of floors, which is my next tip and this is important. Build rooms with floors that fit with the structures placed in them. Allow me to clarify, many structures have a corresponding floor. Grinders and sawmills should be placed in rooms with workshop flooring, while your crafting tables and your smelters should be placed in a room with forge flooring. If they're both in a closed off room and have the appropriate flooring in that entire room, the structure will need less time and resources to do what it wants to do. And it's a big difference. Correct floor makes a structure need 25% less resources. Let's say you get 400 copper and you put that in your smelter. If you don't have the smelter on forge floor, you'll basically waste 100 of that copper. The workshop flooring is probably the one you'll need fastest to maximize your production of planks and bricks. This one is unlocked by defeating Grayson the Armorer in the Bandit Armory. The rest of the different floors are unlocked through research. So again, get your copper coins, 
go buy books from the shady book trader. Tip number six is about where to place your castle. My advice is central or northern Farbane. The reason it can be a good idea to go more to the north is that once you've taken down the bandit king, the next thing you want to do is make your way to the iron mine which is located here. And you'll need a lot of iron. It takes time to refine into ingots, you'll need a lot of ore to do so, and there are a lot of things you'll need iron ingots for. So you need to make quite a few runs to the mine, and if you're playing on a PvP server you don't want to risk running through half of the map with your inventory full of iron to get back to your base. So having a castle here will be a good spot through at least Acts 1 and 2, and then when it's time to head to Gloomrot and Silverlight, it might be time to relocate your castle if there are better plots available. Alternatively, you just pick a spot in Central Farbane and you stick with that for the rest of the game. The reason for this is that all cave teleporters have a connection in Farbane, so you'll always be able to go to the nearest cave and get back to somewhere that's relatively close to your base. One spot that I managed to get on my latest run, which I got by kind of a fluke, meaning that almost all other plots on the servers were taken, was around here. And I have to say it's not bad at all. First of all, it's pretty central, it's more to the south than I initially would have preferred, but it has other things going for it. It's close to two bandit encampments, which we've established is good for farming whetstones, and close to a market, which is good for getting those books. On top of that, it's close to the bandit copper quarry. There's less copper here than the copper mine, but also fewer enemies, and this is no guarantee, but I wouldn't be surprised if you run a smaller risk of having to find other vampires for that copper. Next up is that you should love and cherish all of the materials out there. Stick them in a box, because there are very few materials out there that truly become obsolete before very, very late in the game. Yes, even that plant fiber. Even that sawdust, in fact, especially your plant fiber and sawdust are extremely important since they can be turned into paper in your paper press. Well, paper becomes obsolete after I'm done with the research desk, you might think. Except paper can be turned into scrolls, which can then be turned into schematics. Blood essence after your castle heart is full? Save them, because later on you'll be able to turn regular blood essence into greater blood essence and greater blood essence into primal blood essence, which is a lot faster than relying on enemies dropping unsolid and exquisite hearts. They can be very hard to come by. Tip number 8 is a quick reminder that you can kill V-Blood bosses multiple times, which isn't a bad idea since they have a good chance of dropping unsolid hearts and books. So if you run into one you've already killed and have time to kill, well, kill! Tip number 9 is bear form. It's very useful. It doesn't bear arms, but it has bear arms. <laughs> Sorry for the puns. I have a point, I promise. Bear with me. <laughs> With the bear form, you can slam to destroy big boulders of stone or copper, and you can destroy the gates to the bandit king without using explosives. But one thing that might go unnoticed is that you regenerate health faster when in bear form. So if you've lost a lot of HP and don't have any potions and don't want to consume blood to use blood mend, you can travel to your next destination as a bear. Moving on. As you know, different enemies belong to different factions. The militia and bandits fight each other, both of them will fight any undead they come across. The same goes for V-Blood bosses, and you can use that to your advantage. In Farbane, you can come across Lydia, Gorswine, and the Alpha Wolf fighting each other. Later on, you'll regularly find Meredith and the undead general fighting in the Iron Mine. When one is dead, go in for the bite and then fight the remaining boss who will be damaged already. Remember that unlike when you bite a regular enemy, you can't be damaged when you drain the blood of a V-Blood boss. So don't be scared to sink your teeth into the first one that dies while the other one's still there. Okay, so I thought I'd mention build order, specifically when it comes to your gear. Before I do though, I'd just like to say that there are people out there with a lot more hours than I have who have min-maxed the shit out of this game. Maybe some of them has more optimized ways of doing things, but in case it helps, here's what I do in the early stages. So naturally we all craft a sword, axes, and a mace in the very beginning. When it's time to reinforce your bone weapons, I usually just spend materials on doing that for the mace, since it's the weapon best suited for farming stone and ore, and the big reason we want reinforced gear is to be able to farm copper ore. Once I have copper, I usually go for the spear and the copper mace. And nowadays I get a longbow as well, cause it's so fun to play with. But I still don't bother spending resources on axes. As soon as I get to iron tier, axes are my go-to weapon. But without having unlocked the E abilities, I find that the spear queue and the mace queue are better. 
The Spear Q offers a big burst of damage while the Q on the mace has a great gap closer or getaway tool depending on what you need. And the attack speed of the spear is so high that I cut down trees with the spear until I have my iron axes. It's not like going with the axes early is a terrible idea, but I find that plank and copper ingots are used so much in the game that I'd rather not craft one of every weapon. So maybe the real tip is that you don't need one of every weapon. Imagine if I just said that, this tip would have been a lot shorter. Before I'm done, I want to give two basic tips for combat. One for PvE and one for PvP. But first, I'd just like to say that there are more videos coming about V Rising and other games. So if you enjoyed this, please consider subscribing to the channel. It really helps a small channel like mine out. So the PvE tip is to use one of your necromancy spell points on the Undead Ward. This shield will spawn a skeleton every time it's hit. The reason this tip is a PvE tip is that it's pretty damn useless versus other players. Because these skeletons won't pose a real threat to anything. But versus AI enemies, they will take aggro instead of you, which is very nice. Especially versus some bosses. It's a great way to get a few seconds to land some free hits and let your abilities come off from cooldown. And the final tip, which is useful if you find yourself fighting another player, is to learn how to cancel cast. If you go to options and to the keybinds, you will find the interrupt ability. Assign that to a key you can reach quickly while fighting. I have it on a button on the side of my mouse. The way you use this is to start casting your ability. After your character has started the animation, but before you actually cast the spell, you click the interrupt button to cancel the ability. The reason you do this is to bait out the space or the counter of your opponent. Fire the ability again when your opponent can't do anything to avoid it. And that's it. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you'll watch the next one too. Bye.